Daniel Moriarty was on his daily morning walk on Long Beach, Long Island, on the morning of June 8th, 1931. Down on his luck, he would spend the mornings scouring the beaches for anything worth pawning that may have been left by the rich elite who spent the day there previously. He wove around the coastline, not finding much worth taking, when in the distance he saw something large floating in the water. He approached it and saw it was a woman floating face down in the water. He saw her expensive fitted dress that was ripped and covered in seaweed and sand, and her short hair ravaged by the sea, its tight pin curls unwoven and in a disarray of dark auburn locks. The body was bruised and battered in that of a young woman. What would follow would be years of political scandals, finger pointing, slanderous news articles, and the ultimate question. What killed Star Faithful? I'm your host, Sarah Kent, and you are listening to The Resolution Unknown. Today, we will be discussing the mysterious death of 25-year-old Star Faithful. October 24th, 1929 was a bleak day that brought forth an end to an era of U.S. financial prosperity. The Great Crash, as it became known, brought the stock market crashing down on the heads of Americans. This was a beginning trend of economic hardship, as the events came after a similar crash in the London Stock Exchange just one month earlier. The United States was in a state of transition. World War I was over, but the ravages upon the world left deep gashes. The Roaring Twenties was a time of decadence and luxury, and the people didn't know what was just around the corner for them. This event was the start of a 12-year-long period of hardship for all Western industrialized countries, including France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Canada, Russia, and the United Kingdom. Star Faithful was born Marion Star Wyman on January 27, 1906 in Evanston, Illinois to Frank Wyman II and Helen McGregor Pierce. Helen was from an upper-class, old-money family, but her father had lost the family fortune prior to her marriage to Frank. After Star was born, a younger sister, Elizabeth, was born in 1911 and she went by her nickname, Tucker. The family had little money, so they often had to rely on the charity of Helen's wealthy family. All was mostly well with the family, and this charity allowed for Star and Tucker to attend the prestigious Rogers Hall Academy in Lowell, Massachusetts. Frank was a businessman who was consistently away on long business trips leaving Helen, Star, and Tucker alone. They would then visit Helen's family in Boston. In 1924, Helen and Frank divorced, and Helen went and married Stanley Faithful in 1925. After this, her daughters then took on his last name, Faithful, even though the girls were 19 and 14 and did not see him as a father figure. People described him as a strange, rat-faced man who was a widower and also a failed entrepreneur. He made almost no income to support the family and instead used lawsuits to bring in money. They lived in New Jersey, but after losing their house to foreclosure, they moved to an apartment in Manhattan. In 1917, when Starr was 11, her parents allowed Starr to visit with Andrew J. Peters, her wealthy middle-aged cousin. Andrew had married into the family when he married Helen's cousin in 1910, 
The family enjoyed any interaction with the lavish lifestyle of the wealthy, doting cousin and encouraged this family time to try and help Star stay in the upper-class crowds, which would ultimately improve her chances in landing a rich husband. Andrew was a strong pillar of the community as a local politician and well-known lawyer, and he had been a member of the Massachusetts State Senate from 1904 to 1905, and was also a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1907 to 1914. He would later be elected as the 42nd mayor of Boston in 1918. Andrew was also a friend of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was then the governor of New York and later became president. Because Starr lacked a consistent father figure, Andrew was able to step into this vulnerable girl's life and show her the fatherly attention she craved. At the time, what the family did not know was that Andrew was a pedophile and had begun grooming and molesting the 11-year-old Star on these visits. Andrew would get star high on diethyl ether, commonly known as ether, or creamy dreamy. This was a chemical inhalant that was once used as a general anesthetic, but was also used as a recreational drug to cause intoxication. It gave users intoxication similar to alcohol, but may also give users distorted thinking, euphoria, and visual or auditory hallucinations at a higher dose. It had long ties to Boston, as it was invented and popularized there, and was also known as the Yankee Dodge. Andrew would administer this to young Star, and as the sexual abuse continued, Star began to change. Gone was the happy, outgoing, girly girl, and instead, Star became quiet, reclusive, and began dressing as a boy to try and dissuade her cousin's advances. She began to show signs of mental health issues as she grew older, having severe mood swings and not having many friends. In June 1926, at the age of 20, Andrew invited Star out for a night at the theater. There was a storm that night and Andrew called the family to say that he would get Star a hotel room for the night rather than send her home in the storm. The next morning, when she returned home, Star was extremely upset, and she told her parents that she and Andrew had had natural sex for the first time that night. This was nine years after the beginning of the abuse. Her parents' money issues were prominent at this point, and they used this secret as a tool for blackmail. Rather than turning him over to the police, Stanley and Helen negotiated a lump sum payout of $20,000, or $278,000 of today's money, to keep quiet. There was only supposed to be one payment, but Stanley kept going back demanding more money, and it is believed that there was $80,000, or $1.1 million of today's money being paid out to the faithfuls over the course of this blackmail. Starr spent time in a few mental institutions, but this childhood abuse had changed Starr. She began to act out and started to engage in a flapper lifestyle. On the advice of a psychologist, her parents sent her on a series of cruises for therapeutic reasons where she would travel for extended periods to London, the West Indies, and the Mediterranean. They also paid artist Edwin Megargi to be her sex tutor and teach her how to have normal sexual relations after her traumatic experiences with Peters. Star began to spiral further into a chaotic, flapper lifestyle and began to smoke, drink, and abuse barbiturates heavily to help deal with her emotional issues. In 1928, the head of the American Tobacco Company hired Edward Bernays, a public relations specialist, to help market cigarettes to women. He believed that if they could unlock the female market, it would be like opening a new gold mine right in their front yard. 
This was a tall task, as smoking was considered scandalous and something that no respectable woman would partake in. They decided that vanity would be their approach, as body image is a popular way to convince people to try their products. They first ran a series of print advertisements that claimed the cigarettes as a dieting product. Their most famous slogan being, reach for a lucky instead of a sweet. They also hired a group of beautiful young women to walk in the 1929 Easter Parade in New York while smoking cigarettes. This started controversy. This push for cigarettes got tied in with the political sphere of women's suffrage movements. Smoking as a woman was now a political and trendy statement. When you're buying cigarettes, buy the brand you like. Take good care of yourself, smoke a lucky strike. When you're driving in a car or you're on a hike, take good care of yourself, smoke a lucky strike. This trend began to become associated heavily with the newest trend of the new woman, the flapper. Flappers were young women in the 1920s and early 1930s who wore short bobbed hair, short scandalous skirts, drank, smoked, and revolted against the idea of what a respectable girl would do. Sexual norms were pushed as well, as many girls embraced their sexuality. These girls were a threat to conventional, polite society, but much like anything extreme and different, most people just couldn't look away. Star dropped out of school a few months before her graduation disappointing her family that had supported her. And soon after, Star began going wild with lavish parties, indulging in casual sex, alcohol, and drugs. She became notorious on the ship she was traveling on, where she would get extremely intoxicated and would try to have sexual relations with the handsome ship officers. In March 1931, just a few months before her death, she was admitted to the Bellevue Hospital after being found beaten, naked, and heavily intoxicated in a hotel room in New York. She had met a man that night and checked into the hotel room under the names Joseph Collins and wife. Starr immediately returned to her old risky behaviors upon release from the hospital and became infatuated with Dr. George Jameson Carr, a doctor aboard the Cunard ship lines, after he pumped her stomach after she suffered alcohol poisoning on a wild night out. On May 29, 1931, only days prior to her death, Starr was forcibly removed from the ship due to her highly intoxicated state, only to begin screaming the ominous words, kill me, throw me overboard as she was led to the lifeboats to be rowed to shore. Stanley went to the police to report his daughter missing, stating he had last seen her on June 5th, after she went to get her hair done. A few days later, on June 8th, he returned again, and there was still no news. That same day, he read in the newspaper of the female body that had washed ashore and immediately contacted the police again. He then went and ID'd the body as that of his 25-year-old stepdaughter, Star Faithful. He demanded that the police not contact the press to then bizarrely call a press conference of his own where he lied to the press, claiming Star was a wholesome homebody that didn't date or go to parties and that she had been murdered. The first autopsy showed that Star had died of drowning possibly by being held underwater roughly by two men, because she was covered in bruises. On the second autopsy, it was more thorough and included a toxicology panel that revealed that Star had a large amount of barbiturates in her system. Because George didn't return Star's affections, this enraged her, prompting her to send letters to him begging for his love and explaining how depressed and suicidal she was. These letters weren't given to the police until George had returned from England, 
These letters sent the theories in another direction. On one of the letters, she stated that she wanted to end my worthless, disorderly bore of an existence before I ruin anyone else's life as well. I certainly have made a sordid, futureless mess of it all. I take dope to forget and drink to try and like people, but it is of no use. Everything is an anticlimax to me now. I want oblivion. As soon as the police read these letters, they figured it was an open and shut case. Death by suicide. End of story. Stanley Faithful refused to believe this to be true and paid for handwriting experts to examine the letters. They agreed with Stanley that they were faked, but the police disagreed and dismissed the grieving stepfather. This angered Stanley, who bypassed the police and went straight to the news. He claimed the police had shown shameful official negligence and proposed that hired assassins from Andrew J. Peters had assassinated Starr. He then released copies of the hush money checks and told everyone the truth of Andrew's misdeeds. Once this got out, it exploded the case onto an international level, effectively ruining Andrew's political career and causing him to have a nervous breakdown. After this revelation, the police had to look into whether or not this was an accident, suicide, or murder. Several people in high places will rest easier with her dead, said the local Nassau County District Attorney, Elvin Edwards. When the news of Starr's death hit the public, it was as if a fire had been lit from the story. Newspapers worldwide were publishing front-page stories of the glamorous flapper with the unique name's death. People were fascinated with this enigmatic woman and wanted to know, how did she die? When first questioned publicly about the death, her 19-year-old sister Tucker stated, I'm not sorry she's dead. She's happier. Everybody's happier. The police inquired if Starr had kept a diary, to which her stepfather Stanley denied. But this was a lie. They found that Starr had kept a diary which mysteriously appeared from somewhere in Manhattan, filled with sensational entries detailing her reported 19 sexual conquests, suicidal thoughts, and general thoughts and ideas. It was also discovered that right before Starr's death, Helen and Stanley had contacted Andrew again to try and extort more money, because after the great crash, it made everything much harder on the family financially. Also, according to the FBI, by 1931, gangsters with no ties to the family also found out about the abuse and was using this to extort money from Andrew as well. Police then found another diary and while the contents were never released to the public, apparently, whatever was inside this diary led the police to surmise that she had made her way onto the ship, the Ile de France, where she might have been pushed overboard. No one knows what Star did that night, or who she was with. She had written many times about committing suicide, so she wasn't taken seriously, as they figured if she really was serious about killing herself, she would have done it rather than use it to try and get attention from men. However, she still could have potentially committed suicide, but this does not explain the scratches and bruises that were created perimortem on the body. After all this was said and done, the biggest insult came to Star after the chaos of the events surrounding her mysterious death. Her body was finally cremated, but no one in her family came to claim her remains because they didn't pay the bill. Star, who was unwanted in life, was now unwanted in death. No one knows what the funeral home did with her ashes. In a letter written to her friend prior to her death, Star stated, I am playing a dangerous game. There is no telling 
where I'll land. I'm growing so tired of living alone. I lie awake all night and cry. Nobody loves me, that's why. This case was the O.J. Simpson case of the early 1930s. It was hugely influential in popular culture, inspiring many works of fiction, such as the literary classic Butterfield 8, written by John O'Hara in 1935, which was then created into the Academy Award-winning film of the same name in 1960, starring Elizabeth Taylor. Time magazine referred to the story as a sexy death mystery with a perfect front-page name. Star Faithful had a short, explosive life that burned like a firework, sparking fast and bright, to only fizzle out too quickly. People can guess and try to interpret the facts, but the fact remains that the resolution of the case remains unknown. Thank you for listening to Resolution Unknown. This podcast was written and narrated by Sarah Kent. If you have any questions or topics you would like to have covered, email us at resolutionunknown at gmail.com. Mystery creates wonder, and wonder is the basis of man's desire to understand. Neil Armstrong